Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Just a general way. Oh, yeah. Cool. It is toasty, and I'm hoping at some point a fan will come on, but yeah, St uh, stick with us. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so just a bit of an agenda. Uh, we're going to have a quick intro, and then there are four sections to it. Questions at the end, and this is really something burning. Uh, raise your hand, and I, I'll see if I can get to it. Otherwise, just write them down somewhere, and we'll, we can have um, an, uh, question and answers at the end. Quick introduction about myself. I'm Morgan Rouse. I'm the cloud lead at LSD Open. I'm a dev turned cloud engineer. Uh, we're doing fun things in, in AWS and Azure and GCP. Um, we're solving all of that with code and, and GitOps and you know making it reusable that we can just lay the hundreds of these things down and every time we make it a change to it, it follows that dev paradigm of you know constant improvement or feature build. Um, talk to me about Terraform, Cube, or, or, or anything cloud. Um, and then, yeah, finally, we, we love cloud, but we hate paying the bills, and that's that's really why we're here. Um, I love Amazon, I love Azure, I love GCP, but I do not enjoy paying that that fee every month. Um, quick little preamble about LSD Open. The, the main thing I just want to address is kind of our tech stack and the things that we excel at and the things that we partners around. Just keep an eye out there. Red Hat, Elastic, Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, uh, and Confluent uh, are the main kind of vendors we're dealing with. Um, today, it's all the cloud space, and yeah, we, we do all of them. Happy to help out where our clients' problems are, where our problems are. Um, quick little preamble, again, on why you would choose the cloud. Fast time to market. It, you know, everything's running day zero. You don't need any capital expenditure. Your devs can kind of just spin up things. If you need a database, it's there. You don't need to worry about any kind of security or scaling on your end, you can kind of just trust that you know there's servers out there and a nice managed service fee on top of that to make sure that you're ready to go. And you can imagine sitting in cloud, there, there's more compute, memory allocation than you could potentially have in your data center ready for you to go at, at any point. So it's quite a powerful one to, to understand. You're not really paying for that compute the entire way through the year, and you do have the option of scaling up four times more than you ever think you could, you know. Um, and the next one is just around the offerings. You know, Amazon, I think they have 200 and something different managed services they have right now. We, we don't use most of those. We use the, the ones that actually have big value and, you know, more mature API. But it's great to, you know, to say, you know, if a, if a dev needs something like a Redis, it's there ready to go. If they need something like a time series database, it's there ready to go. If you need to manage Grafana, there's probably one there for you. Um, and you also don't need to manage that or the burden or the patching or the security. It's just kind of really on Amazon. They take that on their, on their own. Um, very reliable. They've got very intensive SLA um, with discounting based on that. It's not something we've really needed to see in cloud space. But, you know, on Amazon, if it drops below 99 and, and two nines, you'll get a 10% discount on your, your fee. And if that crosses anywhere further down, you can get the whole way up to 100%, which is obviously not where you want to be, but you, you know, they haven't really historically needed to make those kind of commitments because they haven't reached SLA in that way. Um, and then also just more secure. They, you know, they have very big investment into it. I talked there quickly around the shared security model where Amazon will manage the managed service side of that. So if you've got a database, they'll make sure that that's running in the best way that it possibly can. And then it's up to you to make sure you're configuring it in the most secure way um, and that's kind of where you, you start getting these ideas on, you know, there's a shared model around it. It's not just you in isolation. Amazon will come back with findings, and they do actually try prompt you for security improvements. Um, when we're talking about cloud, this is normally our bread and butter, what we're talking about. Um, as of the last three months, 66% of, of that is either Amazon, Google Cloud, or Azure. We do talk about the other ones like Alibaba and IBM and moving into the space but they're just not really there. This is where the money is at, this is where the talent's at, this is where the API is at, this is where people are innovating. Um, Amazon, nice and mature, reliable API. You'll see it, uh, it you know, as you start going cross cloud, they really pioneer a lot of things, which is, can either be a good thing or a bad thing, just really depending on how early they were into the space. Um, and you know, they, they truly understand DR, which is something missing from all the other providers. We, we had an exercise a while back where it was, um, you know, we need disaster recovery and all of the data centers need to be 60 kilometers spaced apart with independent power and internet. And we did a bit of research and actually the other two, Google Cloud and Azure, don't really do. So Amazon are really 
pioneers in that space that you can guarantee when you're running A, B, and C availability zones that those are, are a lot more redundant than the other ones may be. Um, and 32% market share, it's hard to avoid. Um, Google Cloud, great, Kubernetes is kind of really what we go to, Google Cloud there. Um, they used to be very good around storage and the costing of storage. They've kind of dialed it back where they, all three are kind of applicable for object storage like S3 or, or cloud storage or, or Bob storage or anything like that. Um, and they're coming with data centers soon. I'll put that with a little bit of an asterisk. That's coming next year, kind of, you know, they've been hinting and alluding it to that for a while, which will really change the market. Um, next one is Azure, you, you know, a bit more new into the market. They, they're really trying to tie in with 365, which is stirring up a bit of a mess. And, you know, they can give you very big discounts for your first year, which is, you know, appealing to a lot of our clients. But what they do find is in the long run, that first year isn't really anything in the bigger scheme of things. You know, your first year where you're starting to lay down things isn't really where your long-term workload cost is. It's actually the year two, year three, year five. Um, yeah. So yeah, just a bit of a breakdown on how do we understand the cost going into it before I start, you know, giving some fun ideas on how we can save some cost. Um, I have a quote in here because, yeah, I thought it'd be good. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. Um, it's important to not distinguish between your cloud provider as an enemy, but, you know, they want to bill you. Um, and they will bill you. And if you leave a VM running or a database running, they are going to bill you. So you need to really understand what they're about and you need to understand what your application is about. And that's the only way that you can confidently say, we can do this cloud thing. You know, you need to be on both sides of that. So here's um, Cost Explorer, just a quick little GIF. You should be able to see all of it. I'm gonna show mainly Amazon, but you can see here we've got an Amazon account. You can break this down as much as you want to, and this really needs to be your friend. We try to look at these things for our clients every kind of week, every day, every now and then, just to make sure there's not a cost sitting there that you weren't expecting. We would love to be um, proactive about finding these things rather than our clients coming to us and saying, wow, that's not really a bill that we're expecting. Um, you can see just in the video as well, you can break that down as far as you want to. You know, if you want to look at different regions, different availability zones, different services, different usage types, data costs, you can break it all up there. You can have that daily and have that monthly, or you can see that over the full year. And it does do a bit of forecasting as well, which is amazing. And you'll just see on the, on the top right there, it also just tells you a quick little, hey, we assessed your account and you're spending a lot more on this particular environment or this particular service, and that might be unusual to you. So it's, it's very handy to use. Next one here is um, just billing in general. How do you know what was invoiced? Sometimes that's a different team. People aren't usually connecting the two dots to, you know, I spun up a VM and now there's an invoice that needed to be paid off. If you have billing access, you can browse through a chair and we, we're looking at an account chair, not too much. And you, you can see, you can go back, I think they've changed it up to 14 months on Amazon. You can go back and look at anything. And you'll see it's very granular. So there's a line item for every cost that you're incurring on, on cloud. It's not hidden from you. It's not we just say, oh, you've got an S3 cost. Every line item is there, and it can be broken up as far as you need it. If you need it divided by tag or anything like that, and I'll get into that soon. And you can see there as well. We can see data transfer, and potentially, you know, the first terabyte is free, and the next terabyte is a different rate, and the, the following 10 terabytes are even at a different rate. It will break all of that down for you. So make that your best friend, and, you know, spend some time just familiarizing yourself with it. It also makes recommendations on saying, you know, you spent a lot more on S3 this month than maybe you needed to. Um, so just take a look at that. The next one is just around general budgeting. Um, so, you know, you would like to know when a problem's coming rather than it just being a problem. This is how you could make a simple monthly budget and, you know, it would alert you that day to say, hey, by the way, you're on trend to break the budget that you set that month. And I would highly recommend per cost center or environment or development team that you want to understand where all of your costs are and people are being reported to on that it's not you know finance needs to come back and say you know you spent a lot more on amazon this year than than we we thought you were it's good for you to preemptively come and say okay we, we left the vm up or the thing scaled a lot more than we were preemptively thinking of you know that's a better conversation in the long run so try make these your best friends and you can do very fun things with these around you know uh, what is the predictor for the next three days or the next seven days? And, you know, it can tell you quite quite immediately there as well. The next thing is, um, I've just labeled this as FinOps. Our, our flavor of this is a tool called InfraCost, 
which is basically as you're changing your infrastructure, it would run an analysis on that and say, the changes you're proposing to your infrastructure, like spinning up more VMs or making a new cube cluster or making another database, would come across and say, we're expecting that cost to look like such. And that's quite powerful because you can apply policy there to say, you know, if a, if a new change is going to double our cost, please just deny it and come talk to us if it's going to do that. So, you know, your engineers have the freedom to move around within reasonable limits, but they do have a bit of a, a parachute there. Um, and you can do other fun things around cost there. You can see on the right side. Um, rather than using GP2 EBS volumes, only use GP3 because they're cheaper and more efficient and more performant. So you can actually deny that before the change ever makes its way in. And FinOps is a, a powerful way to do that. Our, our flavor is always Terraform, and it's, you know, any kind of CI is really where you want to catch that. So InfraCost is a great tool for that. And it can also show, you know, Dev is looking like this, and it can give you fun little reports on how that's been changing over time according to your infrastructure definition as opposed to your, your actual bill at the end of the month. So you can kind of predict things, you know, just based on what changes your engineers are making to the infrastructure. Um, the next section would be cost ownership, because it's one thing to know your cost, it's another to say, well, whose cost is this? Um, this isn't always a, a, a guarantee for every, every one of our customers. You know, they're new into data center, someone adds a credit card, someone signs up with a distributor, and now they're getting a bill. But, you, you know, who's actually spinning up the things, and who has the ability to spin those up? Are you matching the two things together? So, this is ownership. Um, in Amazon, um, you can break that up by AWS organization, and then you would split that by OU account, and you can set up different billing providers on that end. Tiny little picture for it, but you'll see there's different, um, different OUs here, and you can break those up as you need to. So potentially, you could have an engineering team, and you could have team one, two, three, and you can kind of um, aggregate all of that cost to one, that you're sending that off to your CTO rather than individual dev teams. You can break that up as, as granular as you need it to be. The next one is uh, Google Cloud, where they've got billing accounts that map into to projects. You can see them on the end. And yeah, you can do pretty much the same thing, but it's a bit more of a detached model where you will attach billing accounts to different projects. Um, and it's up to you on how you want to break those up. And then in Azure land, they've got logical breakdowns and isolation, and then they've got cost breakdowns. I'm showing the cost breakdown here. Um, and you can see the, the main thing here is you'll have a billing profile which will match an invoice section and then tie off onto a subscription which will tie off to tenancy. Um, and that's how you can kind of decide, so much like Google Cloud. Um, now that you have all of these, you, you know, potentially you could isolate it that a Google project is for a particular dev team and, you know, we've got someone who's the cost owner for that or the management for that. Um, but potentially what you have is you, you have differing concerns. You know, you might have a database team and you have an application team both running in the same logical containerization for your infrastructure. You know, you have virtual machines and database, different people running them, different people with accountability. Um, Amazon, you can do tags. And basically what it says is everything tagged with this will be a line item on your invoice. And that's something that you can do. So, you know, tag every one of your resources. And that's quite an industry standard to develop tagging practice for your resources to say, what environment is it for? You know, if you're doing cost center, you, you're running your business that way, you, you know, anything like that. Um, you can break that up and it will come back on the itemized invoice um, that you would receive on your bill. Google Cloud, much the same. You get labels and Azure, you also have tags. Tags in Azure will actually flow down between different tenants which, and resource groups, which is quite handy that you can have um, uh, tagging actually be your differentiator for cost rather than needing to say, well, you know, this resource group is allocated to this. You can actually just use tags all the way through. Yeah, so there's understanding your cost and making sure we have people that are accountable for that. Um, now let's start looking at cost offenders. And um, yeah, there, there's a lot. So let's start off in the first place where most people go wrong and the, the most highly used service on Amazon is uh, EC2 or virtual machines. When you need a server, there's your server. Um, cost point one, and you see there's a little bag in the corner, and that's, that's really where the nuggets are. But um, yeah, just make sure all of your machines are right sized. I've got a quick little video here on how you can navigate to CloudWatch to see what your usage is of that virtual machine. Um, Trusted Advisor is another service within Amazon that can be very beneficial in that regard, that it will tell you this machine is idle. This load balancer is idle. 
and it can actually just alert you every week. Hey, by the way, you know, there are three new machines that don't seem to be doing much. Should you right size them? Should they still be there? It can be a very handy service to, to enable something like that. And it is all on CloudWatch, and then you can trigger emails off on the, in that case as well. The next one is just to do scaling. If you're managing traditional virtual machines with auto scaling groups or, or scaling groups or anything like that, just make sure that your triggers are set where you need to be. You know, you don't really want to scale when a virtual machine's at 15% because potentially that machine's still idling and it might just scale indefinitely. So there's just the, the wizard that you would see on Amazon to say, you know, I want to target 60% utilization on a, on a machine and we want to make sure that we're kind of meeting that criteria. And there are other f fun things you can do with CloudWatch alarms and scaling triggers to make sure that it's not just CPU or memory, it's maybe the amount of requests I'm getting to a load balancer or the amount of processes or jobs that my virtual machine is doing at that time that it can scale off in that regard as well if you need. The next one is spot instancing, which is, I think, our favorite way to save money. Um, we see massive discounts with this. Um, ultimately, what's happening is, you know, Amazon have large volumes, Google have large volumes, Azure have large volumes of virtual machine, and they're not making use of that 24-7. Um, you know, users will come and say, hey, I need a virtual machine, please can I have one? But there's always a bit of spare compute, and they will give that to you at a discount with the caveat that they can terminate that within a very short amount of time. In Google, this would be a preemptible machine, and in Azure, it's also spotting. And if you can make use of that, please do. You would save a fortune. I'll just flash um, kind of how you can find how that's working. Here's an account that we have. And there's a button on the EC2 page, and you can see there we saved 61% by running Spot. So that's no upfront commitment to Amazon. That's no long-term investment. I don't need to talk to finance at all. I just run Spot, move on with my life. And in six months, if we say, actually, we don't want to do Amazon, we're not tied into any contract. We can terminate those machines. Very powerful way to do it. And the next part here, you'll see, you can also just see the historical pricing on that. It's normally quite API driven and you don't get to see, but you can see kind of how those are changing. Some of them will get cheaper in different regions, different availability zones. All of that information is there and we will talk about how we make use of that a bit better in a bit. The next one is around instance generation. So normally as an API, you, you know, Google will say, here's a, a generation one virtual machine and here's a generation two virtual machine and they'll abstract the, that away. And ultimately what they're doing is it's actually better, more efficient physical hardware underneath that you know, they make more money on it, so they actually give it to you at a bit of a discount. You know, they, they're matching their margins there. So what they are trying to do is they also don't wanna have this technical debt of everyone running on silicon from 20 years ago. They kinda wanna make you move, so they, they do kind of carrot it that you, you know, it's more appetizing to move and normally there's nothing you need to change in your code if it's just a traditional VM and you're not doing anything fancy. So try your best to do that and normally you get better price to performance. Just doing a quick little comparison here. Um, so these are, this is a site called Vantage um, and you can go see EC2 costs whenever you want to and you'll see down the, down the side there it's got a column for how much that would cost on demand, how much that would cost if you reserved it how much that would cost if you were running spot in the last hour. And you know you can also say, just give that cost to me as a monthly. And uh, you'll see here there's version three, C3 large, C4 large, C5 large, C6, C7. And you'll see we've actually moved up in terms of memory available to those machines. And the, the physical process is more efficient at that time. They, you know, often it's a 10%, 5% improvement every time you go down. And you'll see there's also benefits in terms of the networking that's available. And sometimes there's more virtual CPUs available. And you'll see here, as we go down on the newer one, it's actually cheaper to be running the newest one. And you know, when it says C7i, it's an Intel variant, you should be able to just migrate that seamlessly and you can take uh, benefit of that, but you'll see even further down, our spot is even cheaper. So this machine that might cost $65 is actually, uh, I believe that's a 27. So we almost more than half, and that's really where you need to start looking. But pay attention to these tables when you're choosing your machines, understand what they can do, understand the benefits to the new ones, and try, if you're laying down a new virtual machine that day, try lay down the newest one. You're normally gonna get a lot better bang for your buck. The next one is around reserved instance and saving plan. 
This is a bit more around a long-term commitment to Amazon that they can you know, reliably go and provision that silicon. You say to them, we're gonna be running this machine for the next year, 24 seven. We're gonna be running this machine for the next three years. And we will finance that with either no upfront, a half upfront or a full upfront. And as you go up that, you get a better discount on what you're paying for your, your silicon. Um, and ultimately more commit means more discount. There are two flavors of this. There's reserved instance where you can see here we've got some, I'm just gonna, oh. I'm just gonna go here. So this is the recommendation page from Amazon. They, they kind of say, hey, we've looked at the last couple of days. We think if you bought this, you would save this much. And you can see here, if we did no upfront for a one year, so we're not paying anything, we're not talking to finance, we're not, we're not laying any capex, we'd give you 35%. And keep that number in mind because that's a very non-committal number. And then further down here, you know, if we said we would pay for three years and we're gonna pay for it all on day one, I wouldn't advise that depending on where you're at unless you can guaranteed commit you're gonna be doing that for the next three years. But we'll give you 59% off that cost. And you'll see here, here's the upfront cost. You would pay $11,000, $3,000, $4,000, $1,000 that day, and you wouldn't be paying for your VMs for the next three years. So that is an option to you, and you would be getting them at 60% off. I wouldn't tie yourself too far into the three-year ones. I find often the sweet spot, if you can, if you can pivot it with finance, it's a one-year half upfront, is normally where you really get your bang for your buck, and you can plug all of this into CSVs and makes graphs as well. Easy to talk to finance, they, they understand the numbers. The next one is saving plan, where rather than buying very particular kind of virtual machine, you know, I'm looking for generation four of a memory optimized machine, please can I just have general EC2 compute? We're gonna say we're gonna spend this much on EC2 for the next year, and whether that's an R5 large or an R7 large or whatever, please just bundle it all together. And you'll see the kind of savings that we have here, 34%, 36% on a one year no upfront. And when we do a bit more commitment, we get 58 or 59 and 62%. So another good way to get the discount, and this has a lot more flexibility than an RI would. So I would normally recommend try target, you know, if you're spending 100 day on EC2, um, $100 a day on EC2, try target 25 to 40%. Work in a range that's good for you where that you can allocate. Don't target 100% of that off the bat. You're probably going to be disappointed. You can always come back next week and buy more. Rather buy that in, in slower chunks. Target 25, 40%, we want that covered by saving plan and the rest we're willing to take the risk of running on demand. Um, and target that and you'll see it's 60%. So keep that in mind because we just saw spot instances at 61% saving with no upfront cost. So if your application can deal with the interruption, by all means, please go ahead and use spot. Um, and then the last one is CPU architecture, Intel, AMD, ARM, um, they all offer different performance improvements for different workloads, but ultimately the kind of workloads most of us are running, we're not too dependent. The main one to keep a, an eye on is, is ARM. Um, you'll see things do run slightly differently. Some apps don't support um, ARM architectures as yet. But as you make your way down this, again on Vantage, you can see G is, a, is an ARM machine. Graviton is Amazon's language for that. I is an Intel machine and A is an AMD machine. And you'll see much the same performance, much the same networking, but you know, we actually spending $20 less per month on a, on a Graviton machine. Um, and you'll see even in this case, spotting on an on a ARM machine was much cheaper. So Amazon are making a massive push to, to building their own silicon there, that it's much cheaper than what you would get on Intel and AMD. And data center potentially in the next five, 10 years isn't gonna be fighting Intel versus AMD on x86, we're gonna be fighting ARM architecture. So keep an eye on that, and you know, if you're doing Docker, a lot of things will have ARM64 builds, you can use those in any case, but you, you know, your mileage may vary, but there are massive savings to make there. The next one is network, and you know, the, the old adage is Amazon's not a data center, they're just a, an ISP, they, they're selling you bandwidth, um, and this is often where a lot of people start getting tied in. It's hard to estimate these costs up front because they can really be quite, uh, flexible and fluctuating, you can't always guarantee it. Um, all I'll say is just understand where the costs are. Um, understand that when you cross data center, so you're running A, B, and C, if you're moving data across all three of those, you're gonna be paying a fee for that. If it's sitting within a localized data center, you're paying 
a lot less if not free. Um, inbound is all free, egress is not. So potentially there's some good savings there where you can cache things within data center rather than needing to reach out to the internet. Uh, they believe it's not that much, but realistically, data is where they get you. So keep an eye on that and try architect for working around there. The next one is, is NAT gateway. What NAT allows you to do, you know, Amazon say best practice and realistically best practice, you know, you run your, your infrastructure in a private network and front that with public facing infrastructure. But, you know, most of your compute is never actually seeing the internet directly. There's something servicing or balancing that in before. And, you know, now all of a sudden this machine that's sitting in a private network needs to reach out to GitHub and clone something. You would probably need to traverse a NAT gateway. NAT gateway in itself is a good service. It's, it's highly available. It's not something you need to manage. It doesn't have bandwidth constraints if you're running your own. Um, it's very easy to lay down, but, you know, it's a couple of close to $100 per month for every VPC you lay down or every private range you need, um, and they really add up. There's a guy, Corey Quinn, who's a cost-saving expert, uh, and he says, yeah, ladies, if he's expensive to have around, makes you poorer for his presence, no matter whether you're giving or taking, has you pay in multiple ways for everything you tell him, good or bad, he's not your man, he's a managed NAT gateway. And if you've ever deployed a NAT gateway, that will make a lot of sense, but if you haven't, just, just know they're very expensive. <laughs> Um, the next thing is, is private endpointing, um, where, you, you know, if you've got virtual machines sitting in private range and they need to reach out to a database or S3 or, um, you know, Redshift or, or anything, you start seeing a lot more of that traffic, lay down a private endpoint. And ultimately what Amazon will do is they'll say, we'll give you a much, uh, much, much cheaper rate on moving data around to Amazon APIs if you use a private endpoint but some of them will come with a cost on top. So there's a break even there on when you want a VPC endpoint where maybe you wouldn't want to. Um, S3 and DynamoDB are gateway endpoints, which means they're free. And we've just laid those down in every VPC we use because why not? There's a guaranteed saving, very good little breakthrough there. And keep an eye on your cost. Every now and then you'll start seeing, you know, we've added a new service and it's using something fun in Amazon. Make sure you're keeping an eye on that traffic. You can see it all in Cost Explorer just to kind of understand where it's at. Understand what kind of in and out your traffic your, your applications are doing, and VPC endpoints are often that. You're kind of looking at around $70 a month for a VPC endpoint. So, you know, you need to be moving more than $70 uh, worth of traffic, potentially $100. It's very easy to cross that point without even noting it. Um, and then there's just the UI on an S3 and a DynamoDB. Lay them down, every VPC you have, add that to your blueprint on how you do VPCing, guarantee you're gonna save some money there. Next one, um, observability, and we're talking CloudWatch here in particular. Uh, we will get to other ways of doing observability, um, but this is just kind of the experience you're gonna have. A lot of native AWS service will log here by default because you know it's all nicely tied in on Amazon. First one is around metrics, you know, what CPU usage is, is this VM doing? You know, how many requests are coming into my load balancer? Um, you, you know, if you have a custom metric like how many jobs my, my application is running, you can send that off to CloudWatch as well quite easily. They've got very easy set of tools that you can track things like, you know, memory within the VM. Understand custom metrics come at a, at a custom metric cost, which is, I think, 1.5 times what the standard metric cost is on EC2 connections, VM, uh, CPU, et cetera. Um, so just keep in mind when you are doing custom metrics, potentially if you're sending them off to CloudWatch to ship them elsewhere, potentially just try to ship them to the right place in the first time. CloudWatch can end up being very expensive and it's quite an elusive cost to, to understand. The next thing is a feature called EC2 Enhanced Monitoring. What I've found is this is kind of default on most of the, the AWS API. What it does is instead of giving me five minute granularity on metrics on a VM, it will give you one minute and it will charge you for every metric in between. There. Depending on what kind of app you're doing or if you know this thing's rock solid, we know what it's doing, we've got logs, we've got other observability patterns, turn that off. Um, it's, a couple of, uh, it's a couple of dollars per virtual machine per month. Um, just turn that off. If you don't need it, you know, set it and forget it, and potentially you can deny some of that on SCP or incoming policy or in infra cost. The next thing is around retention and, and granularity. I mean, I've spoken about that for custom metrics, but also understand when you are sending in things, do you know, 
do you need to the second metric? It's expensive to query that, it's expensive to store that, it's expensive to upload that. Um, think about what you're doing there. And then retention, you know. <laughs> Hopefully you're sending these things off to a place, and I'm not saying that like send them off to the farm and you never see these logs or metrics again. Uh, but try send them off to somewhere cheaper. CloudWatch storage is pretty much S3 plus some margin. You don't really want it living there long term on CloudWatch. Move it over, set retention, 30 days, 90 days, whatever your, your compliance requirements are, whatever kind of you know, you know, feature needs you have. Send them off, ship them to S3, you, you know, send them off to Vault. Just, yeah, don't keep them on CloudWatch. It is expensive. Next one is around CloudWatch logs. There's another fun setting. By default, it will just retain your log forever, which ends up being very expensive. Same vended S3 price. Um, make sure that everything there has a setting for, you know, we, we only want these logs for a year, um, and it will auto clean them up for you for free, but you don't want to be storing them longer there, and I've seen terabytes and terabytes just sitting in CloudWatch where it shouldn't be. It probably belongs somewhere else where it's easier to query and a lot cheaper to store. Next thing is around log level. You, you know, how many times have you gone through logs and it says debug there because some engineer said, well, I need debug logging. I've, I've added some debug logs. Um, make sure you're going through that every now and then. You can do fun things in CloudWatch around filtering, looking for the word info, warn, log, decide what you need to do. Um, it's really up to you, but I would just say take a look because you, you know when you go the whole way down to debug logging or trace logging, it is, again, very expensive to start storing that. And format, out the gate, a good piece of advice. Some of the observability gurus here in our, in our team Store that in JSON. Uh, we see a lot of multi-line logs, and if you think about how the AWS API is doing, sometimes it's doing batching, but most of the time it's not. So you've got a 20-line, multi-line um, log, it will make 20 API calls there, and that can end up being expensive. So rather, if that was a single JSON object, you're logging a single thing, less API, cheaper, less traffic, less uh, initial opening request. Um, yeah, not better for you. And then ultimately, there's access and VPC flow logs, which is a feature you can enable on a you know, a Kubernetes cluster, a load balancer, and you know, it will just say, hey, I got this traffic, log that off to S3. Make sure you're only logging things you really need. Um, potentially, there are other places you can log that either within the app, uh, but just make sure you're not logging these things for you know, something you wanted to debug a couple of years back, and now it's just been running and building up a bill. Next one is around processing, so you, you know, in, um, in Amazon, you, you get something called log metrics, which is, you know, I've logged something to say, um, a user has logged in, and potentially that's actually a metric. You know, you've got a login metric. And rather than logging that as a log, and also now needing to convert that or process that into a metric, just send the metric in the first place. It's a lot cheaper, you don't need a process. The processing fees are kind of absurd. They're limited to what they can do. You know, you know it's kind of not best practice to need to do um, log metrics at all. Next one is dashboards. Did you know you pay for Amazon CloudWatch dashboards? They're not much, but I don't know why they charge for them. Um, and you probably have a better tool to do it in the first place. Um, and then the next thing is just around query volumes. If you're logging a lot and your devs are interacting with it a lot, they're using the API to search for things, filter for things, understand there's a cost to that. Every time Amazon need to reach out to a disk, they will bill you. And you need to make sure that you know, your engineers are only querying for things that you think are valuable. You only have enough logs that they think are valuable. Um, and then I'll put it here as an alternative. You, you know, potentially CloudWatch isn't the best tool for, for cloud monitoring. Um, I would recommend more bang for buck on Elastic and Grafana. We are big fans of it. We normally just say, let's move observability as a stack rather than dealing with the Amazon intricacies. Some of the AWS CloudWatch APIs are new and a little immature. They're catching up, but you know, metrics is somewhat new and CloudWatch log groups and filtering is, is new and immature. Okay, quick breather. Whew. Is everyone okay? Just me. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Okay, are we good? So there's a fun photo of someone breathing. Such a Moving on. Um, so Kubernetes. This is our bread and butter. We love we love Kube. Everything Kube. I'll start off with our favorite carpenter. We you know we have good relationships with Amazon. They're building this tool. We we like really in the flow with it. If you run in Kube and you're doing cluster autoscaler, you are in for a bad time when you make your way to cloud. You know, you are gonna have unutilized resource like you can't believe. You need to make sure you're using the right tool for the job. And we hope in Carpenter next three years is kind of more CubeSig, CNCF standard that you can apply it on Azure, data center, whatever. For now, it's Amazon specific. 
but what it means is this, and I've sped it up. So you can see at the top there, we've got, we've got two nodes. They've been up 13 days, and we've got some pods. I've just scaled them up. You can see some are running and some are pending. And you can see here, within 40 seconds, we have a new node. And within 56 seconds, 59 seconds, they're all running. So Carpenter's a good tool. ASGs traditionally are running on five-minute loops or crons. So it would have completely missed all of that operation there in the first place. So choosing a good tool that's got its you know, finger on the pulse on what your pods are looking for, it does fun things around bin packing to make sure that you know, you're only asking the quest that you need. It will terminate them nicely. It will respond to spot interruption. It will respond to other events happening in your cube cluster to really just right size. And that is the Swiss Army knife that you want when you're running, especially EKS. Um, and the, the scaling speed that we get there from, you know, we weren't paying for a machine to now within a minute, we're paying for a machine and now that machine's not required, it tore it down. Um, and it, I looked at the, this little demo, it's around 20 seconds later. After I scaled it down now, you can see the machine just takes a couple of seconds there and it's gone. 20 seconds later, you've now deprovisioned your machine, you're not paying for a cost you don't need. Cube is a great place to run things. We're, we're big fans of cubes. Um, cube, and then yeah, again, standard ASGs are slow. Um, next thing is KubeCast, which is a fun little tool. Open source, but there is paid for version where it will do a lot more fun things. What it does is it, it gives you reports and findings, and it will apply a cost to something it sees happening in your cube cluster around, you know, there's a disk sitting around that no one's using. There's um, zero traffic going into this cube deployment. There are 30 instances of this particular pod. No one's using it. The traffic is abysmal. And here's just one of them. Um, it makes like 20 of them. And if you upgrade and get the paid for one, it can kind of actually auto implement these cost saving features depending on which ones you want. The main one we're looking at here is around um, CPU and memory requests. So you can see I've got a, a workload here. And you know, it's, it's requesting uh, 120 meg. Sorry, let me go this way. It's, it's got 128 me, uh, mibibytes requested and you know, uh, uh, sorry, it's asking for 90 and it actually needs 128. So this one's actually running a little bit low. This one here is asking for 55 and we actually think based on the last seven days, it should be running on 13. These are considerations your, your devs don't really bother themselves with. You know, how do I right size my container? I don't actually think should be a dev concern. So why not have tooling just come and set that up for you or make the recommendation to your dev team that they're now accountable for comprehending the cost of the things they're doing. It's not just click the button on GitHub and I've got something running. Actually, it's five times over provisioned. And these are great little things that you can have once a month with your dev team. Hey, let's just go look at the recommendations or buy the license and it will do it for you. Fun little tool, you can see it does the same thing on CPU. And then there's a whole bunch of settings you can say here to say this is a production workload. I actually want some fat on that. Please don't cut it down too hard. Um, and other fun things around, you know, your disks are over provisioned, we're not running enough spot, we've got too many nodes, the service is idle or not even being used. Install it as a home chart, let it be, let it sit, let it analyze for the next couple of days and come back and I'll tell you, you've got cost saving there for sure. Next one is around into AZ traffic. We spoke a bit around uh, data. Normally when you go to cloud, you say, you know, I need three, three data centers because that's really how it doesn't fail. You know, the chance that all three go down is not even there. Um, the next thing you want to do is make sure that your Kubernetes traffic is following your cost um, approach, that you're not crossing that data center or paying the cross data center data transfer cost. Um, and that's something called um, topology-aware routing within Kubernetes. I know these graphs look like a lot, but the main thing is you can see there are less of them. So you can imagine we have uh, originally with, with our topology-aware routing, we've got something hitting a node in data center B. It will just evenly round robin that traffic to uh, service in A, service in B, and service in C. You, you know, you've crossed data You've crossed data center every time a request has been there, pretty much 66% of the time. What topology aware routing can do is it will say, actually, you know, I'm running a, a B or zone one, they call it here. And, you know, I've actually got the, the service backend for that also running in zone one. Rather than traversing data center, let's just send it off there. 
And it's got a whole bunch of failbacks to say, well, listen, actually, this one part is being flooded because all the traffic's going to zone one. It will then recover for you. So ultimately, you get a lot tidier um, of a graph and you spend a lot less on traffic. We find this is a, a big saver here for, for Kubernetes traffic. Um, the next one is just on spot in the first place. You, you know, uh, we try also say run on demand as a backup. There are times where spot's not even available. Um, and here you can see we're using Carpenter. We can say, please use spot and it will find that if it's cheapest, but if there are no spot machines available, please back up onto on demand. So you actually have the best of both. If spot's not even there and not even available as a choice, just use on demand. Um, and it will come and right size that as well for you after the fact. The next thing is to make sure your ingress is working correctly, that you're not routing to, you, you know, um, there's a service in zone one, but you don't have an ingress in zone one. How do you actually move the traffic across? You're always going to be paying that data center, that data transfer cost. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you here just on the LB UI, um, this is what we're talking about, cross zone load balancing. So you make sure that you have a pod running in every data center, every availability center to, to respond to that traffic. And rather than just crossing, you know, the ingress will come onto zone one and then forward it over here to, to zone two or whatever. Just go straight to the node, straight to the machine, and then it will handle the traffic. So you save a hop there. Big, uh, big money saver as well. And then storage. Um, it's not always so easy to have things stateless. But where you can, try consume S3, try consume e, um, EBS, and then ultimately there's EFS. Um, and then, yeah, just make sure your disks are cleaning up in Kubernetes land. Um, yeah, some, some savings there. Try avoid EFS, EBS where you can. Okay, um, we're almost at the end, sorry. Let's see, we're going quite long. Just a quick catch up on storage. You know, we've got S3, we've got Google Cloud Storage, we've got Blob Storage. Make sure you're using the correct class. Um, you get intelligent tiering in Amazon, which is basically you pay management fee and it will, um, it will then just determine that for you. Encryption, make sure you're not doing CMKs as well. That may start to be a bit of an issue. Make sure you're only storing the things you require to store. There is also lifecycle policy within S3 that you can say things older than 30 days, please delete. Um, and then yeah, make sure you're doing your retention. In terms of block like EBS, the main thing here is looking out for unattached disk. I used to work at a place where we had a dashboard and every week we would look at the dashboard on how much we spent on disks that were provisioned that weren't being used. And it was very embarrassing for a long time until we started having automated procedures there. So keep an eye on that. Um, always use GP3, I did talk to that earlier. And then remember when you resize in the console and EBS disk, just make sure that you're also resizing it in the VM as well because there, there is a two part in there. Next one is EFS, like an NFS store, but it's elastic. Great option if you, if you can deal with the latency, not everything can. Can be quite expensive because you are moving data over, over the network. Um, and then also just make sure internally you have something coming and doing retention on that, so that you're not storing things indefinitely if you don't need to. And then uh, finally, the backup service. Um, if you're snapshotting databases every day for the next 10 years, obviously you're gonna spend a fortune there. Just make sure you're choosing what you need to. We've got some guidelines on that as well. Um, next one I'll just power through quickly. Amazon are changing the way they're doing public IP. Starting February 24, you're gonna start paying for every public IP. Traditionally, you only paid for unattached IP. This will be a cost coming to you February 24. Um, if you're on Google Cloud, you'll see they're doing an increase and Azure, they already have all of that lined up. Um, credits and discounts, yeah, so wh why hunt for, for savings when maybe Amazon will pay for it themselves? So there's a whole plethora of different funding options you can get with Amazon around startups, migrations, they call that map, migration accelerate, sandbox credits, just reach out to your cloud partner, they will sort you out. Um, running your, your accounts through a distributor can obviously just give you a little bit of a discount, quite handy, it can also give you better payment terms that your, your finance department might be a bit happier about as well. And then you do also get bulk discounts on CDN, S3, um, RIs and saving plans are a way for that as well. And then also if your organization is large enough, make sure you're having the conversation with your, your vendor to make sure that they are discounting you correctly because as soon as you are spending you know, large amounts in data center, they sh can actually give you discount. And I have seen that go up to 40, 60% in some cases. 
And a shameless plug, we do all of these. <laughs> so if you need any help sorting this out, you know, the kind of back office, that's something we can do. And I thought that kit was hilarious. But, yeah. Okay, conclusion. So, sorry, I see, I see we're running quite late here. First off, understand your costs. Use the tools available to you to alert, to set accountability, to know where the costs are, to understand your historical cost. Set accountability to make sure that it's assigned to a different team that you can at the end of the month say, hey, those are your costs. It's not just the cost sitting there and you know the cost sits with everyone. It's, there's a team behind it. <clears throat> and then ultimately just come back and action the savings. We always try with the big cost first. There's normally a lot of fat that you can take off that, try that, and then just kind of work your day down. And report back, you know, we saved 10% on our Amazon bill in the last month. People love that because, you know, it starts this camaraderie for, you know, let's think about costs. Um, and then finally, just iterate. Uh, do that every quarter, half, or, or. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, all. Yeah.